Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us again for the uh, our digital lecture series on populism and popular culture. Just a quick reminder for those who haven't he been here before, um, our uh, lecture series is about bringing together different approaches to understanding the connections between populism and popular culture. And we really wanted to start a dialogue bet uh, between and beyond um, disciplines. And we also wanted to start a more coherent conversation, also going beyond the academic uh, realm and actually uh, reaching out into the practice uh, field of uh, populism and popular culture. And uh, that's our speakers. Uh, that's why we have uh, Arne Fogelsang uh, today as our speaker, but I'll more on that a little bit later. And uh, before I actually introduce our speaker for today, I just wanted to thank our organizing partners, uh, the Groningen Institute for the Study of Culture, the Research Center for Arts and Society, the Research Center for the Study of Democratic Cultures and Politics, and the research project Popular Music and the Rise of Populism in Europe, financed by the Volkswagen Foundation. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, my co-organizers, uh, Dr. Leonie de Jonge, Dr. Melanie Schiller, and Joanna Zinkevich, who is our mistress of ceremonies, who might help you if you have a problem with an, on the technical side. And now our uh, piece de resistance of today is uh, Arne Vogelgesang. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, he is a founding member of theater label Internil, and under his own name, uh, he has been devising theater and performance objects uh, and projects since 2005. He's interested in new forms of radical political subjectivation online and narratives and mimetic fields they embed themselves into. Arne makes videos, experiments with 3D media, gives talks and workshops on his research projects, and occasionally writes a text, apparently. So you can uh, follow him on Twitter on Foyugazang. But now the floor is all yours, Arne, and thank you so much for being here. Hi, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's very exciting for me to be here. I usually talk in, in German, and I will now try to do that in English and not stumble too much over my notes. Uh, disclaimers first, I will not talk about uh, artistic practice, at least not my artistic practice, and I'm not a practiced populist. Um, I will talk about practical politics, but don't quote me on uh, don't quote me inventing this term. It was coined by a US white supremacist for describing discursive hacks for establishing uh, Nazi talking points in in uh, wider discourses. I'm also no scientist. Uh, I will show mainly primary material, but I give no sources for anything I'm showing you. You have to search it for yourself if you want to have a look again. My science game is is very weak, so to say. I occasionally include interpretations or analysis, but mainly I do what I would call uh, some kind of descriptive storytelling through examples. Since and I'll see if, if all my stuff works here, that seems to work. Since I gave the first iteration of this talk in April 2019, I have collected more examples than we can discuss in the short time frame given today. So with your permission, I'd like to cross out a bit of this stuff from this list. Actually, quite a lot. Luckily, we don't lose that much. There is a recording of a version of this talk um, I'm giving now at a CAS Communication Congress 2019 that has been uh, put online with uh, a live translation that is kind of OK uh, in English. You can find those examples that are, you're seeing now there especially for Gamergate and its function as a right-wing recruiting pool, you will find a lot of English language accounts. If you're not familiar, it's a very interesting, but also large and quite toxic rabbit hole to get yourself into. I always like to point people to Ian Danskin's video on YouTube if they're interested in all this stuff relating to US culture, especially his channel is called Innuendo Studios and he is a really great explainer of things. I myself made a video essay about the QAnon complex at the beginning of this year. It's on YouTube. It has English subtitles, so I won't be speaking about this today because this is also quite complicated. I have chosen these remaining examples of how reality is being reworked with game principles for today because they are from the German speaking sphere and you will be less likely to find accounts on them outside of the German, German speaking communities. Uh, so 
I hope you benefit most of what I'm showing you from what I'm showing you today. With alt right chan culture pickup artists and stochastic terror gun from today's menu, we are also relieved of the most vile content, which is nice because I don't want to stress you out with that stuff. And usually people are quite oof after I tell them about that. Still, I'm talking about radical right wing propaganda and about cyberbullying in my examples in the first one of these. Um, but unless you have personal traumatizing experiences with bullying, you should be okay following along. And one more disclaimer, this thing here might occasionally turn off because I'm speaking, but I'm, I'm not hearing anything. And then my headphones just think they are not needed anymore. So if you see me fiddling around and my voice gets lost for a few seconds, then that's the reason why. So the leading question is, how does the appropriation of game cultures and game techniques affect political action? And I will try to specify this question using the example of the political field of the right, the right wing, the far right, however you might call it. Um, I'm using this term really loosely uh, and don't define it. You can talk about this phenomenon, gamification of politics for all of society. And that might prove very interesting and maybe even more insightful than talking about Nazis, but that's what I'm going to do. And the term to somewhat suitably describe what I'm aiming at is gamification. Gamification is, in fact, a pretty old principle, as are games, but it has been formalized with the advent of game culture industry. The term was coined in, coined in 2002 by Nick Pelling, a British developer of computer games. And gamification is not about games, but about likeness to games. One of the main thing about games is that they allow you to act against your own interests with pleasure. If you ever played in a lottery, you know what I mean. And uh, this is due to one of the most important aspects uh, and the one of maybe most interest uh, in everyone for everyone dealing with gamification that is intrinsic motivation. Games are usually played voluntarily for the fun of it. At least that's what the theory says. In reality, it can be a bit more complicated and we will see that later. But that's the reason why gamification was very hyped in, in the 2010s in the economy where its potential as a ruling technique was recognized and formulated quite early uh, and its potential to turn market events into fanatical religious wars which is what coincidentally happened to a number of societies influenced by gamified social media but that's a different story i use the term gamification quite broadly and especially as a perspective on certain cultural phenomena and the examples i will give you will be as well about gamification in the strict sense as about penetrating levels of discourse with game design or about conceiving of social relationships as a game-like entertainment. The main aspects and applications of gamification can be broken down to different levels. The first structural one is the one most commonly discussed and used in gamification, but the others are actually more interesting, at least from my perspective as a theater maker, um, especially in their potential to organize meritocratic communities that elevate uneigentlichkeit to their modus operandi for dealing with reality. Sorry for this German term. I could not find a really good translation for it, but it has something to do with what theater does. Uh, being in the mode of as if. I'm not going to dive further into theory, but give you a few examples of gamification. Couponing, for example, or bonus miles, everything, uh, progress bars, like you see them here, you can spend a lot of time in your life just watching these. Basically, all formats that are about collecting points, about leveling up. You might remember Weight Watchers, that was a pre-digital example. So these are mechanics that are about setting goals and stimulating the motivation of getting there. Gamification can mean to regulate certain decisions, for example, political decisions. Uh, the German Valomat showing your likely political party preferences exists since 2002. And when preparing for the English translation for this talk, I learned this is based, in fact, on your own Stemweiser. 
Uh, you can use gamification mechanisms to regulate social decisions as well. Uh, with one simple hand movement, you can match your desires with someone else's desires. And you might even get a very practical radar function, turning potential romantic partners into some kind of Pokemons that you can hunt down in your vicinity. Uh, and if you laughed now, uh, so if you got this joke, uh, then it's because of the massive success of Pokemon Go, which gamified movement in public space to an extent that already after half a year after its inception, its users had walked an accumulated distance long enough to leave the solar system, all while being watched over by machines of loving grace. On the one hand, this game's success led to a new field of joint advertising with Pokemons being placed close to shops so people would catch the Pokemon and then buy an iPhone. This is an instance of pervasive gaming. On the other hand, it formed a nexus ready to be exploited, for example, by US neo-Nazis from the Daily Stormer, distributing flyers in GIMS with Pokemons for overlapping their young target audiences. And aptly, uh, the call for this flyer action at Pokemon infected GIMS was released in 2016 on the Daily Stormer website as a challenge. So the whole propaganda was also designed as a game. And one more example from the German mainstream entertainment and uh, a different political field. The entertainers Yoko and Klaas, which are quite famous in Germany, play in a show on private television against their own channel. Uh, they game for airtime, which they often use when they win the airtime for political messages. So they have gamified their own civic engagement as celebrities in some sort of a win-win-win situation on TV. And that was the first time that my headphones turned off. Now, the question is, what bad things can happen when these techniques of engagement are used to stimulate and channel political action? And there are some bad things that can happen. Generally, games are mastered by those who either make them or manage to successfully break the rules and uh, who get others to play along in their own game. And that is my first example. Let's switch over. Drachen game means um, dragon game in English. And this is how it got its name. Rainer Winkler is a German YouTuber that calls himself Dragon Lord, Drachen Lord. Uh, he has been a YouTuber since 2011, doing Let's Plays, talking about his favorite music, st stuff people do, have done, have been doing on YouTube. Because um, he is like he is, partly because of his looks, of his ways of talking, whatever it is, um, he soon drew attacks, satirical attacks and mockery. And this mockery spawned a whole community of haters, a cyberbullying mob. And this community of haters that kept growing very quickly conceptualized the fight between them and Winkler because um, he was not really content with being bullied off YouTube but kept doing videos for 10 years. Uh, they conceptualized the fight between them and Winkler as the Drachen game, as a game, or as the game of trolls, which was another name for it. Uh, as a series, they divided into over 14 seasons, each covering a distinctive period of activity with some sort of spectacular ending. So they started fictionalizing their own attacks and his fighting back in order to increase the entertainment value of the whole bullying and to decrease the reality of the violence they have been inflicting. Not as a conscious decision, I'm, I think, but that's just the effect of what they did. Drachen game became famous more than outside of the smaller community first by the season eight finale. That was Metvoch. Uh, the, the game, the picture here is unrelated. It's just to illustrate what Metvoch means. It's a play on words uh, with uh, the community term Met, which is ground beef in German, juicy ground beef, and it's meant to denote the juicy entertainment value of conflict or drama. 
and in the second part, the German word for Wednesday, Mittwoch, because the whole thing took place on a Wednesday. Rainer Winkler had fallen in love with an unknown young woman in chat, so just over the internet, and he announced a proposal. And this is how it went. Uh, the following video, uh, by the way, where have I got? I'm here. Uh, the following video I, I will have edited out of the uh, of the recorded version of this whole thing because I don't want to reproduce it, uh, but I will show it to you now live so you know what this is about. Yeah, this is uh, Dorian the superhuman to the far left there, a prominent member of the troll community of haters who had organized the whole thing. Uh, I don't know if you can imagine happening this to you with 5,000 people watching online, I can't. Um, but talking more about Dorian, during the video battle tournament qualification, qualification 2015, which he mentions at the end, uh, that was a hip hop video battle. He also gifted German neo-Nazis with uh, what has become one of their most favorite t-shirt designs. Du Idiot hast weder Haare noch nen blassen, auch Talent und nach dem Umzug ins KZ kann man dich Aschehaufen nennen. Du Nogger, ich erwürge dich, du Bitch. Du bist zwar nicht unter zwölf, doch du wirst von mir gefickt. Ist auch wirklich jeder Blick, dass ich das Leben verneine und mit dem Töten von Gesinde du Hygiene betreib. Yeah, so that's kind of the humor uh, that was popular back then in the community. After Mettwoch happened, uh, hashtag Drachenlord became number one of the German Twitter trends. Uh, after the 2016 shooting when a racist killed nine people in a shopping mall in Munich in Germany, the hater community pushed images of Winkler as a supposed terrorist via Twitter, managing to have him shown in the Russian Novosti channel as the perpetrator. They pulled the same stunt a few weeks ago when in Norway a man went on a killing spree with bow and arrow and they managed to get some accounts on Twitter with higher reach to uh, retweet the allegations and the photos of Rainer Winkler. They showed, now my script has turned off. Things keep turning off here. Um, uh, that they, they renamed him to Rainer Winklersen to play a joke on, on Norwegian language, uh, which then the retweets led to several international news pages uh, featuring Winkler's photo and the fake name, with that name also trending on Twitter for some hours. The main forum uh, of the hater community on a website devoted to jokes featured over 300,000 entries on the Drachen game alone. In the summer of 2018, more than 800 people turned up to a supposed festival near Winkler's home, which they call the home the Dragon's Redoubt. Uh, and they were throwing stones and axe. They started a forest fire. You hear the sirens in the background. Uh, they prompted a large-scale police operation and nationwide press coverage around the Drachen game. For since Winkler self-doxed his address in a live stream in 2014, calling out to people, "Come visit me." His house in a small village in Franconia, with only 42 inhabitants, has become some sort of a dark pilgrimage site, with people driving into the village daily, prompting so many police calls every day that the municipality made lasting legislation to limit the right of assembly in town. There have been lots of filming, there have been physical attacks, firecrackers, paint smeared on his house, his father's grave was desecrated, he was the first victim of swatting in Germany, with the perpetrator later being sentenced to three plus years in prison. There are at least two big weblogs devoted to Drachen game, the Altschauerberg Express and the Altschauerberger Anzeiger, featuring daily news on the Drachen game, on whatever he's doing. There are lexicon-like archives and chronicles of the whole thing. The toxic relationship between the YouTuber and his haters amongst his uh, 165,000 subscribers, and of all, not all of them are haters, but a lot of them are, uh, this relationship is emotionally built on something that the vlogger Natalie Vinn has aptly described as morbid cringe in an essay on the US equivalents of the phenomenon like Chris Chan. And this relationship evokes an obsessive creativity amongst some of the haters, producing some kind of dark fan fiction, expressing the ambivalent emotional relationship at play there. The main well, and uh, yeah, Rainer Winkler 
Drache, Altschauerberg, Amskirchen, the places where, they, where he lives, have become German memes in text form, also his image in image form, something like, bear with me, the German paper, in a way. And they have been they have become an important cultural reference point for the new internet right, which adopted the Drachen game and its toxicity quite similarly to the way alt right activism co opted image sport culture in the US. The whole game went so far that um, the central hater community forum was presumably shut down by the administrator last summer. Not that they didn't find a new forum, then that was shut down and now they have another one. Uh, so they don't get driven off the internet so easily. And on October 21st this year, that means a week ago, Winkler was sentenced to two years of imprisonment for assault and battery of two haters who had visited him at his house and provoked him, filmed him losing his temper and attacked them, and then went to police with the recordings. Haters instantly celebrated this sentence uh, in expectation of a prison season of the Drachen game. And <laughs> astonishingly, the state prosecutor appealed the decision of the court in order to reach an even longer prison time for Winkler, mind you, not for the haters. So that is the Drachen game. After this, in a way, more diffuse in general example, let's look into a production of the German speaking identitarian movement. This is largely a 2020 story. And let me get out of the picture again to show you what it is about. Heimat Defender Rebellion is a retro platformer, so it is a computer game, from the identitarian scene in Germany. In the game, you can play key figures from the German New Right as characters. You might know Martin Zellner or Götz Kubitschek. You might not know the others. Um, and you play against a company called Globo Homo that wants to turn all humans into soulless transgender robots and is, rep is represented by caricatures of far-right enemy figures like George Soros and uh, German ones that you also maybe don't know. The game was financed by German right-wing NGO 1%. Also ein Prozent ist eine hervorragende Initiative, weil es einfach so eine Art, um, ja, ist so eine Art uh, Greenpeace für Deutschland. 1% organizes the distribution of fundraised money and attention in the intersection of right-wing populist, folkish and neo-fascist projects in the German sphere. The game is downloadable on the developer's homepage and it was also to be released on Steam, but then it was banned and it was indexed this year, this spring, by the German Federal Review Board. And 1%, uh, uh, the NGO announced taking legal action against the decision in March, but so far did not publish any updates on the proceedings. So, so far it's still banned. The claim of 1% for advertising the game is as follows. Am 15. September veröffentlichen wir von 1% das erste patriotische Computerspiel, Heimat Defender Rebellion. Es gibt unterm Strich keine rechte patriotische Entwicklerteams, außer dich. Das heißt, wir haben eigentlich unterm Strich das erste patriotische Computerspiel geschaffen. So kann man das, denke ich, schon sagen. Well, that is how you can say it, but of course it's not true. There was uh, Pogromly, there was Concentration Camp Manager, Ethnic Cleansing the Game, Nightmare of the Zionist Controlled Government, Muslim Massacre, Red Hunt, Morhun with Jewish Chickens, there was Arkanoid with Black People, there have been Rape Simulators, School Shooter Simulators, or more recently, a game from the image board scene where you can play Hitler, Mussolini, Trump, Paper the Frog, or the Christchurch terrorist and shoot liberals, Democrats, queer people, or feminists which incidentally is fully identical to the gameplay of Homeland Defender. The game in question, uh, Homeland, Homeland Defender, Heimat Defender was developed by Cult Games. And this is the homepage that you're seeing there. Developer Roland Moritz was head of an Austrian identitarian movement chapter. We already saw him in the video with Philipp Stein, the, the guy from 1%. 
Moritz is part of the quote unquote patriotic artist collective cult gang. Um, they, they write a V instead of a U because, you know, the Roman Empire and, and whatever. And the aesthetics of the game and of much of what cult gang members make is fash wave, the fascist appropriation of the 80s, 80s retro hype of the 2010s, namely of synth wave and of vapor wave. In addition to that, the pixel optics and the two dimensionality of the game follows a trend in indie games to counter the photorealism of big triple a titles with historically conscious and more formal aesthetics it also means saving uh, on graphics which means having a smaller file size the whole game is just one file you can easily give it to someone else on a usb stick which of course is important for a propaganda game Besides a lot of self-referential celebrations of their own little neo-right identitarian bubble that is too boring to translate, uh, the game also references troll culture. Not only is the legendary German Reichsburger Dr. Axel Stoll included as a character, he is also introduced with a synth wave song produced. <laughs> produced by people from the Drachen, Drachen game troll scene. Uh, this is the same YouTube account you're seeing there, who you earlier saw drawing picture of Rainer, pictures of Rainer Winkler, who produced the song. Other references in game are to the US alt-right and the image board scene. And first and foremost of it is the NPC meme that frames liberals as non-player characters brainwashed by the elites that you can, I don't know, kill easily like you kill NPCs in computer games maybe. And that's a bit interesting about the game because with Heimat Defender this game culture inspired meme about reality returns from the political real world into the game story completing a cultural feedback loop. You now play NPCs but it, this is only the joke that can only work after you formally uh, attributed the NPC characteristics to real people. There are also several dog whistles like Globo Homo, uh, the company you're fighting against. The peer group will know the term means gay Jews, but they can also always fall back onto saying it denotes global homogenization. And uh, then when criticized for the term, they will talk about ethno pluralism and can just place their talking points. All in all, this exemplifies a discursive game with divided audiences uh, that I'm sure you know quite well in the German sphere that means you just ordered three beers and you didn't make a Nazi salute uh, or you waved with your left hand but definitely not with your right hand or you well you just made an okay sign what's so bad about that uh, this could also be well observed in the presentation live stream of Heimat Defender in September 2020 when they launched the game uh, and the game and the man playing became more exuberant yeah! 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 Whoops, there it is. And uh, the live stream operator at this moment very quickly changed cameras when this happened. So this is how that works. The political game of the game runs on four levels. First level is the game itself as a propaganda tool. The goal when making such a game, of course, is wide distribution. Therefore, they also made an additional English version that has been advertised through right wing influencer channels to an international audience, English speaking audience. The target group for this is young men starting in schools. Um, as I mentioned, that to give something, someone uh, something on a USB stick, it's like a typical distribution form on schoolyards. And this is how the developer rationalizes that target audience. Computerspiele sind tendenziell, sie sind kompetitiv. Ja, es gibt auch viele Spiele, die irgendwie Kriegssimulationen sind oder Kampf. Ist, meistens ist es irgendeine Form von Kampfsimulation. Mm -hmm. Und das ist durchaus etwas, was, was halt äh, ja, junge Männer anspricht, die ähm, sie vielleicht nicht sonderlich beheimatet fühlen in der modernen ja, kapitalistischen Welt, wie auch immer, die irgendwas suchen. Und es ist zwar nicht explizit politisch, aber Computerspiele sind irgendwie ein bisschen äh, politisch unkorrekt. Und deswegen finde ich, es ist schon einmal von Haus aus ein, ein, ein dankbares Medium. Ich glaube, dass es auf, äh, beim, beim durchschnittlichen Gamer auf einem fruchtbaren Boden eher vielleicht fällt. Ja. 
Now, I did not talk about Gamergate, but when you know a bit about it, you will have noticed that the image of an average gamer that he is painting there is more like a Gamergater. There are, in fact, more women than men that play digital games today. Uh, they dominate the mobile market, but this is not part of the target audience. And um, re repeating and reinforcing the image of the typical gamer as this angry young man who is disenfranchised and want to beat, wants to beat everything is, of course, uh, an interest for the political right. On the second level, uh, there is a game on the attention for the game, gaming public attention. The calculated provocation of this game's very existence uh, counts on media excitement about it. And when German public medium ZDF published a feature about Heimat Defender in TV aiming to show its danger, this was seen by the makers of the game as a twofold success. First, it was unpaid promotion and then they could imagine having successfully trolled a big TV station into getting themselves drawn into a shitstorm because that's what they got. In the case of Heimat Defender, this shitstorm was made possible through the exploitable tension between public media reporting and self-representations of the gaming community at large, which is historically tense to say the least. In Germany, I don't know what, what it's like in your countries, but we had we have had years of killer game debates about do games make people commit atrocities and the like. So vloggers from the gaming scene had to position themselves as critical to alarmist public media reporting about the game, about any game for that, for that matter, and still keep their distance from the content without upsetting their own community, which was not that easy. For Heimat Defender, this meant significant reach directly into the target audience. In the case of the Channel Kuchen TV that you see discussed here in the screenshots, that was close to a million people who were following him on YouTube. And then he was talking about the game. The third level is gaming the discourse of the game to public attention for the game. You see, it gets a bit more complicated. And I will show you what I mean with the example of a Let's Play YouTube video on Heimat Defender by another YouTube channel called Massengeschmack TV. They did a Let's Play critical of the right-wing messaging in the game, as far as they understood it. Still, they made a Let's Play with it. Not such a good idea, maybe. And what you see here is a flood of comments under the video thanking the channel owners for making the game known. The social interface is an integral part of the YouTube game, and one of the most popular moves in comment battles is to frame criticism as advertisement. It sends uh, a signal to the addressees, you can criticize us as much as you want in the fight for attention. We will remain victors because you have less control over the effect of your criticism than we do. We rule the comment section. The crucial point here is mobilization and coordination of commenters. And the aim of such a comment storm is to reduce debate focused on arguments to an exchange of performative gestures of dominance. This kind of subversion of discourse has for a while been at the heart of radical right-wing politics. I think you will have already talked about this, uh, about this in, in the series of lectures. Uh, I have the pleasure of speaking in now. Here I am. And the fourth level um, of the whole construct is building up on all these achievements on the previous levels by multiplying the formula. In spring 2021, the Heimat Defender developer launched the uh, quote unquote first patriotic game jam. It was called Heimat Jam. The event produced seven game prototypes that were all downloadable from the web page. Uh, Moritz's declared goal is to build up an international networked radical right-wing game developer scene uh, in German-speaking countries, but also beyond. This cultural initiative is flanked, for example, by regular gamer meetings of uh, Junge Alternative, which is the youth organization of Germany's AfD party, which is also trying to rec recruit among gamers, mostly among uh, male gamers, of course. Such an organization of structures, and that leads me to my last example, also needs tools. And one of those tools, 
potential tools was occasionally mentioned in Heimat Defender discussions. Let me switch over to the last panel here. This is Patriot Peer. So I have assumed uh, your familiari familiarity with some of the characters I, I just dropped in here uh, so far, but for those of you who don't actually know the former Austrian leader of the identitarian movement, this is him. For all those who don't know me, my name is Martin Sellner. I'm a patriotic activist and blogger. And that's a frog showing a frog when Sellner presented Patriot Peer to Patriot Pierce some years ago, I think in the north of Germany. The identitarian movement in Germany worked very hard on bringing Paper the Frog in all its glory to German speaking countries. And they worked hard, but they did not really succeed. This costume action was not well received even among Patriot Pierce. And it was meant to be a promotion for the app Patriot Peer because they tried to employ the frog logo in there and kind of connect to the international meme. The app Patriot Peer is meant, it's a mobile app, is meant to visualize a supposed, quote unquote, silent majority of patriots who are just not taking over the power in Europe because they are too afraid to come out of the closet and they need an app to change that. You get a Patriot radar, exactly like Tinder, and you have a Patriot scan um, when you meet someone and scan each other's uh, contacts, so you get experience points for that, for meeting other people. Und damit haben wir eine Art augmented reality, live action role playing, Patriotenspiele, wo noch besser Namen dafür geschaffen, in dem dein Ziel sein muss, in deiner Stadt, in deiner Gegend, die ganzen grünen Punkte zu scannen, zu blauen Punkten zu machen. Es gibt ein Leaderboard, also eine ähm, Rangliste in einer Stadt, in einem Land und weltweit. Wir werden wahrscheinlich so einen gerne monatlichen monatlichen Preis für den Top-Patrioten der Welt ausschreiben und es gibt, ich habe schon einen Rollenspielaspekt angesprochen, drei verschiedene Möglichkeiten, drei Pfade, um Punkte zu bekommen. Well, it just occurred to me that uh, a week ago the new, um, the year's youth word, <laughs> we have an organization in Germany that, that kind of says this is, the, this is the youth word of the year and uh, they they crowned cringe as the youth word of, of 2021. I don't know why it came to my mind. So you get experience points for networking with other users when you use the app, for stickering Nazi propaganda, or for visiting and checking in at all German cultural monuments that are of some importance for the cultural right. And the goal in the app is for top users to become, and I quote Martin Sander here, as desirable as rare Pokemons. There was a fundraising on Kickstarter in 2017 that was halted after four days, days after people protested against the platform supporting far-right content. The development continued nonetheless uh, and was supposed to be ready by the end of 2018. There was a beta testing round announced. Es ist die Gamification des Widerstands. Das ist der Kerngedanke dahinter und ähm, die beiden Grundfeatures, wie ihr seht, funktionieren schon ähm, problemlos. But then there were problems. The identitarian movement in Austria was searched by police and was pressured by a court case. Amazon Web Service hosting the project was cancelled and apparently the main developer quit and took the source code with him. So they had to set up the app anew. But they continued working with um, one or sometimes two developers, but the other developer kept kind of leaving the boat. So it's mainly one guy, I think. Uh, there was a developer log homepage that quickly went offline again, but there has been a Telegram channel about the, the development of the game that has been online and been fed news since early November 2019. The current development start status of, of the app shows a map with players, player locations, and with events. And uh, the places uh, come with information on, I quote, history, community, religion, and crime. So if you have fascists making an app where you can mark certain places with a religion or crime, that is, of course, meant to 
mark targets and not just as a uh, as an innocent information is meant also for networking with militia groups etc this is not supposed to be just an app for the identitarian movement which is hardly in existence anymore but for the general far right places and events are partly only visible from close up uh, so if you if you get closer to the actual place which is a feature meant to for example promote non-public events in rural areas uh, concerts or trainings uh, you just get information on where roughly to go and then if you are user of the app you will see the actual location where something takes place so it becomes easier to organize semi-clandestine meetings with the app also movements of groups could be coordinated uh, you maybe know critical maps the application that does that for um for bicycle demonstrations so if you imagine there's a kind of a large far-right demonstration in the city and then small more radical groups splinter off and try to i don't know beat up people or um, do whatever they want to do in the city then they can see where the others are with the app the visibility of a user's location, of a user's name, of a profile picture, etc., for other players, for other users of the app, is adjustable by level. Uh, that mean you have, it means you have some access barriers. Peering, meeting other people, raising your level uh, is some kind as a, uh, of a validation process. Only if you have met so and so many other patriots and uh, they have kind of qualified you and given you the experience and you reach a higher level, you will actually be able to use the full potential of the whole app. At the same time, you have something like a trust level with that in the community. Patriot Peer is now in the fifth year of its development and supposedly this spring the app was ready, uh, version one, apart from an integrated chat that had to be redone. There was also a close, close testing announced before and maybe this testing is running now, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's not. There have been no updates in the developer channel since April. And um, the whole development of Patriot Peer has become its own meme in right-wing circles as the app that will never come. Here there are YouTube comments under the Heimat Defender live stream that talk about just that because it has really been going on for years. But time will tell if it will be published or not. As of yet, I don't know that it is already in the wild. That was my last example. That's all from me so far. Thank you very much for listening. And um, now maybe let's talk about what this all means or what you think about it.